upon the breakout, gold's going to make a new all-time highs. Gold-backed ETFs seen inflows of over five billion. Point eight trillion dollar gold market. Why are we the only guys to see on this planet? Raise your heads, Ben. Hey there, welcome to this episode of Live from the Vault. My name is Shane Moran, and I will be your host. And as you can imagine, the Kinesis Global Community is growing very fast. Thank you so much, everyone. Please keep spreading the word about this channel by liking. Hit that like button, not now, but right now. Uh, you can share it. And also, uh, if you want to subscribe, just click on that bell notification, and you'll be notified as these episodes actually go live. And so with that, it is amazing. I know we're going to have a great show today on Live from the Vault. And let's get over to the UK for Talking Gold with Andrew McGuire. Hey, Andy, how are you doing there in the UK? Yeah, really well, Shane. Nice to be with you again, my friend. We had a very, very frantic week buying silver. I hope all you guys were doing the same thing. We had a really good week. Well, it's hard to believe that it's already been two weeks since our last episode. And since then, we've experienced a lot of volatility in the gold and silver markets. You know, usually we start off by picking up on the various threads of our last or most recent episode, but we've got a lot of questions here. And I think the most common is uh, people want to know what's happening in the short term. Yeah, and I think that is always the first question is because people are hovering either hovering over a mouse uh, do I buy more silver today? Do I buy, buy more gold today, or or do I wait? I mean, this is a it's it's a fair question. Um, look, it is the perfect place to start. Then, um, in our last episode, uh, we actually drew attention to what was really I think it was a real lot of confusion about you know how come the gold price was going down. It was this unsustainability of really what was obviously a counterintuitive COMEX driven downside overshoot of physical gold and silver wholesale support levels, which, as we were saying at the time, under the covers, evidenced actually very large size institutional spot index buying by these same actors that were also evidencing stealthy insider short covering. And if you remember, we covered spot indexing before. Essentially, all that is, is when you can go onto the spot market, you lock in a price, you demand delivery, uh, and in two days, essentially what you're doing is locking the price in. Now you may have to pay a premium over that, but essentially you've locked that price in. So if the price is, was 20, I think we were in the 25s last time we spoke. And so if you'd locked in, a, if you bought in spot, spot at 25 and it was trading at what, 27 or something today, well then you'd still have the right to have it at 25. So essentially that that's what spot indexing is, but very short term, intraday, intra week volatility aside, look, we're evidencing both gold and silver carving out much higher stair steps to rally from. Now, every single bank desk we've spoken to over the last two weeks since the last episode is positioning long physical gold and silver for their own book. And what does that tell you? <laughs> Into a fast closing Basel three window. And yes, this includes the banks currently calling gold about 200 bucks lower, which which is, of course, no coincidence. And there's reasons that they're trying to do that. So, but footprints in the wholesale market telegraph that banks do not want to be short, naked short gold for their own book. And as we've discussed in our last episode, China and the UAE raised the ante in this race to square up years and years of highly leveraged, aggregated, unallocated FX gold positions. So that's where we are immediately. Well, that makes a great deal of sense, Andy. And uh, we've had some questions about the LBMA's effort to influence the physical market and also with China stepping up uh, the gold imports. Can you give us some updates on, on both of these items? Yeah, Shane, tons of questions around this. And I'll expand on the unfolding UAE story in a moment. But since China lifted the cap on gold imports into extremely strong, uh, very concurrent Indian demand. And if you remember, we were talking about Indian demand all the way through the last few months. Indian demand is strong. And we had, we were getting reports from, uh, you know, from, from various mainstream news services that said, oh, Indian demand is weak. Absolutely incorrect. We knew it was strong. And so right on the back of, of China upping this cap, and Indian demand, we've evidenced both gold and silver 
physically, uh, physical buying really ramping up. And, and what that does is, of course, tighten supply into what are now sold out Swiss refineries. They're pushing out orders to August right now. Or if you want to pay a large premium, you, you can get immediate delivery. But essentially what we're saying is paper price is not the real price. Now, this activity is really most visible in the deep and consistent backwardations where we evidence this non-delivery COMEX June gold futures contract trading at a discount to the 10 times larger spot gold foreign exchange markets. In other words, the, the real price being set in London today or the, the, the spot price being set in the markets today, we've seen June gold trading like a buck 30, up to a buck 30 below that price. What that does and we've been through what that means in the past, that telegraphs the paper market casino is actually providing us an actionable discount to, to, to go after. Um, and basically there's still billions of dollars of unallocated gold positions to unwind before the Basel III 85% haircut makes it just far too expensive for these insiders or officials to engage in gold lending or hypothecation. This is a, a huge deal. And as we've recently outlined to explain the seemingly counterintuitive volatility into such strong physical demand into the race, you know, really it's a race to exit these unallocated gold positions. What it initially requires, and we were very careful to go through the reasoning for this, is selling foreign exchange for the FX gold uh, position to buy back the dollar leg of these crosses. Uh, and in other words, uh, when you buy or sell uh, gold or silver as a currency, then obviously there's two sides to that. You're either long one and short the other. So it's you know, long gold, short the dollar. In this case, if you want to buy back an unallocated contract, you've got to sell that foreign exchange gold position to buy and to square up this dollar leg. Same with silver. So my message to everyone, though, because this is really important. This is where all the questions are coming from. Please do not be wrong footed by the recent deliberately generated COMEX driven volatility as the unallocated gold unwind process evolves. And that's that's what we're witnessing here. So dips, really what we're saying is dips will continue to be bought. And this, this volatility provides us actually all of us stackers or if you're bullish if just bullish and 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 you've got a bullish bias trading uh, position these are opportunities these are opportunities to be jumped on and it's all about the unwind of heavily leveraged paper market positions so insiders are busy unwinding unallocated over-the-counter gold positions and the unwind of these unallocated foreign exchange contracts of course, initially involves selling this long side of, remember, a hundred to one leverage contract to buy back and square off this trade. So you're dealing with leverage here. And this initially creates the kind of counterintuitive volatility we've really experienced this week too, which is undoubtedly being actively gamed to the insider's advantage. Now, obviously, if you're just looking at the chart and you see the price shoot down, you think everyone's selling. It's not the case. They're covering. And what you can bet, you can bet the coincident calls for lower price gold. And gosh, don't they come in just as gold's about to get, uh, uh, just as soon as gold ticks down. These are the same actors getting on the mainstream media, scrambling to square off undeliverable gold credit obligations. This is not physical. There are multiple examples of this. And we look, we evidenced on Tuesday uh, just as soon as London closed for the day, exited, suddenly m paper market liquidity uh, thins out. What happens? We see 35,000 contracts of COMEX suddenly sell dumped in illiquid conditions after the London, after, this is after London shop, shop for the day on Tuesday. So, you know, that's just an example of, of, of how this, this volatility uh, is sort of exacerbated. And of course, oh. any excuse to cause disruption would be seized on. And this time it was Yellen on the, and the excuse to troll out for troll long stops based upon really a non event. But ultimately, this draining of paper market liquidity improves the paper to physical balance. And, and I think that's one of the big messages we're trying to get across. Uh, and what we've been drawing unwanted attention to is this 
frantic LBMA lobby attempts to exempt unallocated gold from this Basel III NSFR haircut, which by so far they have failed in doing. Now this week, in collaboration with the World Gold Council, and, and it, it's, it's up there, you guys, you can pull it up yourself. I mean, it, it, it's farcical. Uh, they made another desperate attempt to save themselves. And as they put it, uh, the upcoming 85%, this is their words, uh, the, the, uh, this upcoming 85% unallocated gold haircut, quote, risks collapsing the LPMCL clearing and settlement process. I mean, really? Of course, and good riddance. And we look at this lobby attempt in more, I mean, we'll look at it closer in, in, in a moment, but by no coincidence, it follows hot on the heels of the CMA, CME, getting back into the mix by trying to buy more time and they did this last friday so they were kind of foreshadowed this this was going to happen and what has spurred this is it, what's happened is following a move and if you remember we talked about this um some months back following a move by several of the first and second tier banks to exit the profitable third party storage business. And of course, we remember that was at the end of December, we saw Scotia Mercado. We've actually seen Swiss banks withdrawing over the last few months. And basically what that's done, as they've entered, exited this third party storage business, it, reals, it means that they, they, the real uh, legitimate COMEX hedging activity that they used to actually employ the, the, the COMEX for legitimate hedging uh, uh, positions, that's severely reduced. And we, and we, as I say, I covered this story a couple of months ago. So in collaboration with the scrambling LBMA, the CME is desperately trying to buy time to stem this outflow of legitimate hedging open interest. Now, these hedging transactions used to provide an underpinning anchor for the rapidly unraveling uh, EFP to ETF conduit. Andrew, to answer another subscriber question, could you please briefly outline the EFP and the ETFs connection? Absolutely, and I think this is it's important because, I mean, look, as traders, <laughs> we, we just take it for granted, but I think it's really important. And also to keep it simple, I mean, really, this is a straightforward, this is a scam, essentially. So. <laughs> Um, so we, we, we kind of look, a quick summary of this exchange for futures for physicals, it's called an EFP. And, and then, of course, that segues into the ETF scam. We all know what an ETF is, exchange, you know, so that's, that's like GLD, uh, uh, SLV, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what happens is the buyer of an EFP can exchange a futures position or a physical position of equal quantity. That's, the, the, that's how it's sold. That, that would be fine if that was real. But this can, gear, this can be either, to, of course, to initiate or liquidate a futures position, which would be legitimate, a, a really legitimate uh, uh, transaction. Um, and, and of course, however, in 2005, um, shares in GLD and iShares and these ETFs, as well as SLV, were sanctioned to be actually equivalent to real allocated physical gold in the eyes of the COMEX for delivery against a futures contract in an EFP transaction. So, and that's despite these ETFs having the ability to be naked shorted. So, you know, how, how it was arrived at that this would be equivalent to physical, allocated physical gold uh, was, is, is of course, highly suspicious. Um, but given both transactions are little more than an exchange of gold credit, not physical, it explains the massive inflows and outflows of unallocated bullion. So Shane, this explains the interconnected gold and silver fix gaming and the resulting recent large ETF outflows, which a lot of people are questioning. How come, you know, how come that we're seeing all these outflows and, was, and, and, and the market's strong? And we've experienced and we've experienced this into very tight backwardated spot and physical market. So this is a key question answered. And as we all know, unallocated gold and silver does not represent bullion on hand. It merely reflects gold and silver credit positions on the books of an individual LBMA bank with counterparty risk. 
and, and much like when you deposit money into the bank, isn't it? So, so essentially, if a client wants to withdraw unallocated gold or silver under an unallocated gold or silver agreement, it can be settled for cash. So there's no requirement to, for the bank to go to market to buy the bullion. So given the ETF on and off ramps uh, into and out of these ETFs are in the form of unallocated gold or silver, even into a wholesale market starved of bullion, the moment an ETF position flows out in unallocated form on the books of an authorized participant, like JP, JP Morgan, it could be, there's several authorized participants, and under the radar, it can be squared for cash at that point. And this is what's happening. And it's bullish ahead of Basel III. And it's clearly the BIS current mandate to dislodge and square off as many of these unallocated EF, ETF positions that ballooned following the March 2020 EFP blowup, which we went through in detail in March, April, May. We, 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 we've looked at this so many times. And this leads us into the unwind of these unallocated foreign exchange contracts, which, as we just pointed out, initially involves selling the long side of a 100 to 1 leverage contract to buy back and square off the trade. Now, this initially creates this counterintuitive volatility, which, as we say, is undoubtedly game to the insider's advantage, but ultimately improves the paper to physical balance, which is something that is so close to my heart. And just ahead of this week's fresh LBMA lobby attempt to avert this 85% haircut, and this is, the, this is the one we're just talking about, and you can pull it up on, on, the, on the LBMA website, by no coincidence, last Friday, the CME stepped in with an advisory, which clearly attempts to buy a little extra time to unwind these massive accrued mismatch of really essentially of how little physical gold underpins published registered CME gold warrants currently shuffled between house insiders. And, and then when we see deliveries, often it's just a shuffle. And however, this stalling tactic, what it does is exposes a weak hand, which is not going unnoticed by every other jurisdiction that must comply by June 28th. So um, I, I'm just going to read you a little excerpt here. I think it's really important. I'm going to read you a little excerpt from uh, a CME advisory. Um, and basically what it says uh, is um, the CME currently accepts London gold bullion and gold warrants as collateral to meet base and IRS performance bond requirements in the house origin with aggregate of 750 million per clearing member and affiliates. There is, there, then what they say is there are no changes to this limit, despite Basel three coming on, with the expansion of acceptability to the customer origins. Additionally, the current haircut applied to London gold bullion and gold warrants will remain at 15%. Interesting. Now, to give an idea of scale, we must keep in mind what is at stake here. Currently, a gold asset is counted as a long, fractionally held, over-the-counter, unallocated gold position, 100 to 1, when hedged with a futures contract, which is based on air. Now, these transactions constitute unallocated positions. So, so what that is, just fiat gold credit hedging a fractionally bailed, uh, a backed futures contract. So to eliminate this interbank counterparty risk, unbacked derivative gold will absolutely require an 85% haircut that closely confluences with this estimated 100 to 1 paper to physical leverage, which is already admitted by industry apologists. So by necessity, this incestuous relationship between these two competing bodies seeks to buy more time to unwind a massive mismatch of interconnected, unallocated gold positions, which unfortunately for the LBMA and CME, presents a big opportunity for competing central banks to actually capitalize on this very short-term jurisdictional opportunity. Now we're seeing this now, and there's a huge opportunity here. Now given the US, along with all other global gold, gold trading centers, except loco London, must also be compliant by June 28th. It is only the loco London unallocated COMEX 4GC warrants 
and, and we'll look at that in a second, that will continue to be exempt from the 85% haircut for six more months. Now, even if this failed unused contract is reactivated, this will still greatly restrict the kind of volumes of gold able to be cleared through the LPMCL every day. Now, following the November, if you remember in November, we went through and looked at the catch 22 arbitrage debacle, massive shortage of physical and the uh, COMEX with $6 backwardations, i.e. we saw up to um, the, the futures market set up to $6 less than what uh, in a starved market. And of course, what it did create this arbitrage where anything over two bucks and really even a Swiss uh, entity that really that covers the 50 cents to take delivery. It, uh, it covers the, tr the transportation cost and by crikey, what a lovely profit on top of that. I mean, so yes, if this cost, if you remember this, we estimate it costs the CME about 12 million in losses to cash settle delivery demands, which they really did not want to see this bullion uh, exiting. So what that cash settlement was, was essentially what would it cost to buy around 10 tons of gold uh, on the open market in a bilaterally settled deal. It was about 40 bucks a contract. So 40 bucks an ounce. So that's cost them 12 million. So, so after that, this 4GC contract evaporated to zero, the volume in it to zero. And it's unlikely we see officials attempt to employ this, re-employ this loco London contract as it exposes the gold cartels Achilles heel. Yes, Andrew, I remember we looked at this very odd London contract last year, and you predicted last year that this particular style of contract would fail. Um, this must be, must be an embarrassment to the CME. What's going on with this? Well, I guess really the answer, Shane, is absolutely nothing, my friend. And, and yes, yes, it is a massive embarrassment for the cartel. And it, it, what it's done is shot them in the foot. And the cost to actually, just think about it, the cost to take delivery of a 4GC contract. This is a contract where the bullion is supposed to be sitting in London. <laughs> so so, uh, so this is a 400 ounce bar. And, and so really to take delivery would be only 50 cents because these bars are supposed to be vaulted in London. There's no associated shipping cost. So it doesn't cost, doesn't, you don't need $2. Um, discount to actually come after that contract. So now these London contracts, I mean, we know these contracts are almost certainly unallocated, which means that futures market backwardations against the spot market must be carefully managed because you're only talking about 50 cents. Um, otherwise, local London traders will simply go and buy and exchange these four GC contracts for local delivery. Well, my, my information is you try and buy one. They don't want they will not. In fact, they're blocking the purchase of these at, the, at this point. You literally you there should be no reason why you couldn't go and buy those contracts. And I sincerely suggest that uh, if you are a paper market player and you do want to take delivery and you are a bank and you want to take delivery, Go after those contracts because you're going to actually put the squeeze on the on the local London market. Currently, there's zero zero open interest on them. So, wow. essentially, what we're saying, Shane, is directly after this, as we described, it, we had this EFP blow up in March 20, uh, 2020, and between March and August, if you remember, gold rose over six hundred bucks in silver in the same period rose uh, over 18 bucks. And this, it was because of this shortage of physical gold that fractured this EFP conduit, which we're now focusing on. And currently we're evidencing Swiss refineries sold out into August for any size. So what we're saying is any deeper backwardations from here could threaten another EFP blow up. And look what happened last time. And especially as we saw an exit of second tier banks since then, who've exited this third party custody business and have not returned to use the COMEX as a hedging uh, tool. So this is the catch 22 predicament the house has got itself into. And it's the first time in 50 years, Shane, of COMEX control of the COMEX price setting mechanism that I've ever seen it come under attack as in the gold market. So 
really kind of to sum, sum it up, right now, look, we're evidencing a global move to square up unallocated gold positions. Uh, paper market liquidity is draining, which will further tighten up physical supply. And for the first time since March 2020, we're once again evidencing these Swiss refiners sold out for bullion for immediate delivery. OK, yes, you can pay a premium and get it. So it's not exactly the same, but it is a stressful situation if you are naked short. And note the recent large ETF outflows have not relieved this condition. Why? Because as we just described, what's happening is as soon as they come out, they're being squared because the BIS cannot square a, a, an ETF contract with a keystroke. And, and, and we've drawn attention to the ability of the BIS to ultimately square any residual non-compliant unallocated contract sitting on the balance sheet of an agent too big to fail uh, taxpayer insured bank who would have an, a, a gold account with the Bank of England and would be part of the, the whole situation. Um, so, so, you know, really what we're saying is um, the problem for officials is, is that GLD and SLV and iShares rehypothecated inventories, inventories are supposed to represent allocated bullion. So they just cannot be squared in, in by, with a keystroke. So we are certain, we're absolutely certain there's a large imbalance following the March 2020 EFP blow up. Now, if you remember, these ETFs recorded literally hundreds and tons of physical inflows during a period when the entire global delivery mechanisms were frozen. And, and this clearly telegraphed to everyone in this industry, to, in, in, in the wholesale market, liquidity providers, everyone, shaking their heads. This was supposed to, these inflows were no more than official unallocated swaps. And, and, and really, we, all, we kind of discussed swaps last time. Really, nothing ever leaves in physical form. These, these are just unallocated contracts that go and sit on the books of the too big to fail banks, agent banks. And this was also exactly when the unallocated 4GC contract you referred to was cobbled together. So these resulting liabilities now sit on the books of these agent banks, but not with the BIS. So while... Agent banks acting for the BIS can have this unallocated gold credit on their own books squared for cash. This is not possible to do with the unallocated gold positions currently making up a significant percentage of the two primary ETFs used as flywheels for gold by the officials. And, and this, this is going to be remain our short term focus um, as it clearly is in the BIS crosshairs as they try and assist these too big to fail agent banks who have hundreds of tons of ETF liabilities laid on their box. And that's really what this is about. So really what we're saying is to escape this 85% valuation haircut, along with all gold credit stored at banks, funds and depositories, all gold ETF holdings must be fully allocated, titled to those trusts by June 28th to pass a bar count and a valuation audit. I mean, <laughs> ahead of Basel III standards being enforced on June 28th. Otherwise, this, this whole thing turns on its head. And as we reported in January, this is also one of the reasons why trading and bullion banks are currently ditching the profitable third party custody business. This all adds up. If you look at all the pieces of the pie, they're all adding up. And this includes first tier LBMA, LBMA banks with footprints in Europe where the frantically lobbied six month LBM extension for the UK to comply the June 28th will simply not apply. So therefore, and out of the 8,000 odd tons cleared through London every day, how much do you think of that is legitimate business? So such a small amount, there's only three to five tons physically delivered out of all of this. Now, okay, it's, there is some legitimate uh, financing, uh, financing transactions within that, but not 8,000 tons. Um, so we're kind of focused on this fast closing Basel III window, which will be the last date for banks to unwind these very large unallocated gold positions before this haircut makes it far too expensive for them to engage in gold lending or hypothecation. So in anticipation of this new regulation, banks do not want to be short gold. So, but by no coincidence, the CME advisory last Friday foreshadowed the lobby attempt 
and that we just witnessed has been actually the second lobby attempt. And this follows our assertion that the LBMA physical ring fencing attempt is actually backfiring, which we'll, we'll, we'll look at this shortly. But when what we evidence in the second and more desperate LBMA, this one here that we're referring to, and you really do suggest you, you, you look at it, uh, what, what, they're, what, we're, what we're looking at here, this is a desperation attempt. Um, and this is a world, and the World Gold Council is pushback, is attempting to lobby the Bank of England regulatory body, which is the Prudential Regulation Authority. The, the, so this PRA, uh, and it, it, they're seeking to exempt unallocated gold from this paper market um, uh, killer blow, is what it is. And there are good reasons why this effort will fail. Now, as far as the over-the-counter gold clearing and settlement is concerned, so really what would really it's all about this allocated metal well everyone understands what that is what it should be it is neither an asset or a liability on anyone's balance sheet of a, certainly on the balance sheet of a clearing bank we're talking about clearing banks here so let's stick to that so obviously it's not a liability or an asset if it's hedged for currency risk uh, and then of course that excludes it from uh, this required stable funding calculations. So that's fine. But as we know, unallocated gold makes up the bulk of all daily gold trading volumes cleared through the LPMCL. Now, the holders of unallocated gold are categorized as unsecure creditors, and that's actually in the paper. Through the settlement of clearing process, these high counterparty risk paper gold credit transactions are really currently shuffled around as we know, inside a daisy chain of LBMA bullion banks who net this out, this, it's really, it's called working stock. It, it's not physical. Uh, and they net it out on their books at the end of each day with almost no physical gold ever changing hands. So, but following the 2008 financial crisis, Basel III rules were drawn up to eliminate massive derivative driven interbank counterparty risk. Now, trillions of dollars worth of unallocated gold positions actually pose the greatest and largest interbank counterparty risk. So Basel III seeks to eliminate this risk. So as of June 28th, it's these gold credit transactions that will receive this 85% haircut, while on the other hand, real allocated physical gold will receive a 0% risk weight. That will, of course, and we've been through this before, that really applies to gold billion held in a bank or in another bank on an allocated basis. And, and obviously, uh, then that would need to be hedged one-to-one -to, -one to eliminate the currency risk. So really, 0% cash weighting. Now, the arguments proposed... Now, this is, this is where it gets interesting, and it's in this document. And, and you know, you don't, I mean, rather than spending two days looking through it, um, I mean, basically, this is the World Gold Council and the uh, and really, who, I, who in my opinion, does a very poor job of representing the industry that it purports to represent. Uh, and, and what they've done is they put that into three kind of bullet points. And, and, and I've got the bullet points here, which is really just to go through them because it's very important. This is a game changer. Um, so first of all, bullet, there's three. First bullet point, undermine clearing and settlement. So it says the required stable funding for short-term assets would significantly increase the cost for LPMCL clearing banks to the point that some would be forced to exit the clearing and settlement system, which may even be at risk of collapsing completely. Andy, I think that anyone watching this uh, has to understand that we are living in historical times with these precious metals markets. Well, look, <laughs> what they're saying, Shane, uh, and what were they saying? What are they saying is going to collapse here? What is it? It's the ability to shuffle trillions of dollars of high counterparty risk. Really, something the BIS is actually forced to address. So I say no joy on that point. Uh, point two: uh, what dramatically increased financing costs? And then they're saying. The required stable funding would penalize LBMA members who hold unallocated balances of precious metals. Oh, go figure. And this would increase the cost of short-term precious metals financing transactions as stable funding costs are passed through to non-bank market participants. 
What poppycock is that? I mean, clearly, to even suggest that almost three years of mine supply is cleared by the LPMCL every single day to suggest that's necessary to back up short-term producer merchant financing transactions or, or, or any of the precious metal financing transactions, it's, it's actually beyond a joke. So really out of the 8,000 odd tons of paper gold cleared every day, only around three to five tons are ever delivered. So, so what a joke that is. And, and then point three, and we get to the bottom of it. I mean, honestly, this, this is all, the, all the, the main points. It'll curtail central bank operations. And they say fewer LPMCL clearing banks may cur curtail central bank deposit lending and swaps in precious metals. Really? Okay. Uh, these operations are essential to offset the cost of storing gold reserves and generating income. Yeah, I'll bet. In addition to this provides important liquidity to the market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What kind of what kind of liquidity? We're talking about paper market liquidity that no way represents real physical supply. Look, they go on to argue in this document that the effects of an 85 RSF change would not just be limited to the London gold market, but would be felt globally across the entire gold value chain. And, and of course, really what, what they're saying is, uh, really they're saying is that this is actually a major risk. This would fundamentally alter the structure and attractiveness of the market. Good God. I mean, really, I mean, and, and this is this is where they fall down on their argument. Yes, central banks and in particular BIS and the cent is the central bank of all central banks. Yes, they've done a very good job of containing the price of gold over the dollar against the dollar as part of the strategy of intervening in all of the currency crosses, of which gold obviously represents about 15 trillion. When, But when you factor in derivatives, that represents a staggering close to 70 trillion of transaction. I mean, I'm talking about derivatives benchmarked at every LBMA London fix. And this is a potential Lehman on steroids. However, something even bigger is at stake here. And what it is, and this is the main point that a lot of people are missing, it's all about US dollar hegemony. And while the general and understandable view is that officials headed by the BIS gold desk in Basel hate gold and want to continue to suppress gold prices ad infinitum, in reality, Basel III changes its stance because defending the growing threat to the US dollar hegemony is far more important. Andrew, you know I want to get into the silver uh, questions. It's my favorite topic, of course, but just before I do, um, we were talking earlier, you were saying, um, and you mentioned, I think you mentioned twice now that the CME has issued another interesting advisory last week. Can you elaborate on what is this advisory? Yeah, I've, just, I've got a copy of, I've, it really is a very quick thing. And, and, and I've just got a copy of it here. But essentially, uh, this, this CME advisory came through last Friday, follows our assertion that the LBMA physical ring fencing attempt is actually backfiring. And, and the following knee jerk response here is also ill advised and is going to backfire. Now, just this extract, it says, um, says here, Per current practice, CME does not accept gold warrants representing ELEM, which is an and El Etihad brand of gold bars. In other words, we're not going to accept any UA, UAE gold bars as collateral. And so therefore, uh, they're actually essentially blacklisting those bars. Now, OK, so the CME, the LBM, LBM, well, we talked about this briefly before, but the LBMA and CMA full court press attempt, this is what it is, seek, is seeking to ring fence their cozy little arrangement to try and stem the erosion of really what is their monopolistic hold over the global physical markets. And clearly, the CME and LBMA are defensively on the back foot here. And as we summed up in our last episode, the house is reliant on operating within this fractionally held working stock environment where physical deliveries actually represent little more than um, elect, 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 electronically matched deallocated gold and silver positions, which are just netted out on the books of the LBMA members. So 
But it's precisely this ring fenced activity that's enabled the gold price discovery to be controlled by this 10 times larger unallocated over the counter market, which is, of course, directly related to the gold futures market, hence this incestuous relationship. And it's this directly related price setting COMEX leg setting the price of deliverable gold in the global markets that is actually under attack. And it really would have been far better served the CME to back off and not dig in their heels here, because we had meetings with our UAE contacts this week reaffirming they are gaining support for the establishment of a physically settled, globally accepted 49's non-LBMA standard bar contract. And if you recall, we discussed this back in September. And you know very well that Russia, China, a lot of the BRICS countries, a lot of the Asian exchanges are physical exchanges. Really, the LBMA served its purpose. The LBMA is really hanging, trying to hang on to really just the paper shred of a paper game here. It cannot possibly wash. Um, so really, I see the LBMA is facing headwinds they've never envisaged before. I see them under attack on two flanks. The inability to counter this unallocated 85% haircut, which I cannot see them doing under these rules, and their ring fence brand is going to face unfactored competition. This was never factored in. And what is ultimately going to emerge is a physically settled global price, something the industry has been begging for for the last 50 years. And the only solution for the central banks to get on the long side ahead of this gold price revaluation is to get, on the get, to get ahead of it and to go long ahead of Basel III. And, and we know absolutely from, per, from from our own experience. We see every single first and second tier desk we speak to is that they're either long physical for their own book or busy exiting high counterparty risk unallocated gold positions, even if they're not the, uh, underwater at this point. So what we're saying is US dollar hegemony is under attack. China and Russia and gold rich BRICS countries are happy to revalue gold against the dollar. So it's what is where does that leave? Where does that leave the LBMA? And as we know, so really under Basel III uh, NSFR standards, every central bank will now be able to revalue its physical reserves higher from the current 50% haircut into a full, fully cash exchangeable asset. Now central banks will be able to pay off massive swathes of debt by revaluing gold, and not just from a cash asset perspective, but also it would really it would behove them central banks to be on the long side of gold ahead of this revaluation and that's what i think we're seeing this move by china in lockstep with russia dumping dollars for gold is a signal they're breaking rank from an agreement to keep the price of gold contained the attack on us dollar hegemony moves center stage and a gold price revaluation is the freshly launched incoming missile for those holding physical gold and silver actually the timing could not be any better. Physical gold and silver. You brought up my favorite word here, silver, Andrew. There's a rumor, by the way, just before I got on the call here, uh, that you're going to be doing a Q&A with Wall Street silver. Is that a rumor? Or is that uh, true? And maybe while well, you're at it, bring us up to date with what's happening in the exciting, always exciting silver market. Yeah, I'm visiting with our dear friends, at Wall Street Silver next week and, and really looking forward to embracing uh, any of your questions, a lot of the questions. And I really look forward to seeing you all then. I mean, I mean, but look, you know, as you say, Shane, I know you're a silver guy. I know, I know. I mean, you're, 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 you, 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 you to me are the epitome of a silver guy. Uh, everything you, you live and breathe silver. <laughs> the, this, it's the, look, this, squeeze, so-called squeeze, is unfolding extremely well. Now, and we talked about this, this Reddit, Wall Street, Silver Short Street group, they become a very powerful movement. And they think this is what the important part is. It isn't just a few trades. This is a powerful movement. And I think it's going to endure. Uh, and obviously, because they're dealing in physical and the re that's the reason it will endure. This is this is this short squeeze is being driven by fully paid up 
Silver demand coming in from thousands of Reddit Raptors really swarming into a grossly undervalued physical silver and gold market. And the, the, the key to this onslaught, to keep it up as it progressively drives the wholesale silver market price higher. That benefits everybody, including the miners, the producers, everyone involved. I mean, this paper rig game has got to end. These are unleveraged, fully paid up silver stackers, and they don't play this rigged COMEX in, in this rigged COMEX sandpit. It is, that's all it is. In fact, what they do anytime there's a discount, what are they doing? See them on there. Let's get some more. Let's double down. When the house tries to shake them out, they just buy more. This is a silver arrow that puts the Ecomex Achilles heel right in the crosshairs. And it really, really heartens me. And I, I, I honestly believe this to see the pride taken by these guys. I mean, they literally, even the guy that can afford one coin is so proud to display it. I mean, they video themselves taking delivery of this stuff. Look, together, all of us, no matter how big or small, buying physical gold becomes part of the solution. So in 45 years of precious metals trading and investing, I have never seen such passion behind a trade because of its movement. So to those doubters who do not underestimate, please do not underestimate the power of this physically driven short squeeze. It has barely started. You just cannot rinse these diamond hands out. And, and this, as this trade gains momentum and its success spreads, spreads across this Reddit communities, look, it potentially brings in up to 10 million Reddit Raptors swarming into a short squeeze into an undervalued asset. This is my dream. I see it. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? As you see something, really, a lot of guys are just momentum chasers. But I mean, these Wall Street silver guys are real. And as other people see it from the outside, they say, hey, maybe you should get into it. And, and so you realize, hang on a minute, this is just an undervalued asset. This is an undervalued commodity. It's an undervalued currency. Well, of course, talk about a short squeeze. This is the short squeeze of all short squeezes. And, and once silver starts to squeeze, you're, into, you're talking into the hundreds of dollars. And, and really, why not? Um, look, these guys are buying everything that any insider dares, is for, dares or is going to be forced to offer. And this is unprecedented. So while the COMEX registered deliveries, uh, they're actually supposed to be there, we know they're leveraged. They're rehypothecated. It's not a single, there's not a single bad actor that wants to sell you their bullion at today's prices, even as we move up today. I mean, of course not. And as part of this movement to squeeze the silver market and to draw attention to the anniversary of this of the notorious May the 1st COMEX deliver, uh, driven, do you remember the 2011 price rigging event? So our pal, Craig Ferguson, he joined up with Wall Street Silver and a lot of friends calling initially for just 100,000 silver stackers to buy 100 ounces of the at the same time for physical delivery to make a statement on this un, uh, unchallenged by the regulators anniversary of a massive, massive hit. On, on the silver market when everyone was, was closed, when China was away when uh, on holiday, when the UK was on holiday, just the, the, just the COMEX open. And we see a $6 move. I mean, $30 per contract, 300, sorry, $30,000 per contract, rinsed two ways. I mean, come on. And if you wanna go, go onto the History Channel, The Secret World of Gold, there's a perfect example. We walk, literally, I walk through uh, the, the, the cameras through this, uh, this rigged event. And, and so what we're saying is, look, th this, this short squeeze, uh, this criminal attack on silver, uh, when that commenced at 1 a.m. in the morning that, time, that day that we talked about, um, what, what really the, the, Craig was trying to draw attention to here was, guys, look, Come on, let's fight back. This is a way of fighting back. And never before has there been an army of people to be able to do this with. So I'm, what I'm saying is thank you guys for all you do. And uh, really, 
I know I did my part last week. I'm continuing to do my part. Guys, do your part completely. All you're doing is swapping. You're depreciating fiat dollars for physical silver. And I'm not, this is not me saying, it's not me telling you to do a trade. What it is, is, is saying, think about your dollars. Think about what, what they can buy. And really, to buy silver at these prices, to me, is a absolute bargain. All right. Physical silver, physical gold, physical silver, physical gold. Thank you. There you have it. Another uh, fascinating episode with Andrew McGuire here on Live from the Vault. Uh, again, please make sure you help spread the word about this channel by hitting that like button, uh, sharing the video with people you know, like, and trust, and also subscribing. Um, if you click on the bell when you subscribe, you'll be notified as these episodes go live. Thank you very much, and we will see you. Oh, one more thing. Please comment below and uh, tell us who you'd most like to have us interview regarding physical, uh, of course, physical precious metals, and we'll do our best to get them on here uh, or get, the, get these interviews going. So with that, uh, we'll see you next time on Live from the Vault. See you then.